Well, hello everybody there. Um, this is Troy with Five Solas Films and we have another conversation for you today and we are we have to travel a good distance for this one. We're going all the way to London. Of course, if you're in London, it's not a long distance, um, but I'm so thankful to have on with us Pastor Andrew Wilson. Welcome. Uh, yeah, nice to be with you, Troy. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So even though we're here in California, and I was just telling you it was 80 degrees yesterday, you're in London, and I'm looking out that window over your shoulder. It looks a little bit more dreary. It's very uh, we... gray. <laughs> it's very sad. <laughs> we went on we... lots of things, but we don't win on weather, I'm afraid. That's the... <laughs> At this time, though, even in this strange season of COVID and lockdowns and so forth, uh, we're so thankful to have the warmth of Christmas arriving here in a few days. Um, mm -hmm. and, and really, that's what I, I, I just want you and I to talk about here, uh, the hope that Christ brings to us. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and one way that, that you have revealed that is in writing this special little book, Sophie and the Heidelberg Cat. Where did the concept come from? Why did you've written theology books? You're mm -hmm. a, a, pa a pastor at a big church in London, King's Church. Um, uh, but why did you decide I want to write a kids' book and try to include some some deep truths in it? Okay, so I um, so I, I have young kids myself, um, and about five or six years ago, I was I was really tired and run out I too, our oldest two have got both got special needs it's pretty challenging and we and my wife very kindly gave me a break to go away for three days and just have like a retreat and I wanted to do a little tour of reformation sites in Europe which I hope would fit with a five solars kind of uh, vision as well and I, I did a little driving around I flew to Geneva and I drove around went to Basel went through Melanchthon Strasser and in basically I did various different places I went and I, but I, my main goal was Heidelberg and I went to because I'd heard about the Heidelberg Catechism but I didn't really know enough about it and so I went there I took with me Kevin de Young's book The Good News We Almost Forgot which is a book that sort of expands the Heidelberg Catechism and preaches through it really and I just fell in love with this text. I just thought it was marvelous. And I ever and since then, I then started tweeting using the hashtag #HeiCat H E I C A T as an abbreviation. And the concept just came to me while doing that. I was like the Heidelberg cat, like Heiker. I wonder if I could use this at some point as a means for teaching about Christianity. And of course, being a dad with young kids, you read a lot of poetic rhyming books to children. And the combination made me think maybe I could do a kid's book based on this catechism. And so eventually zeroed in on question one and decided to see if I could write it. Wow, that's great. Now, you hinted at this. Uh, if, as you look at the book, there's some very sweet pictures of Sophie and this little cat as they go on a little adventure um, throughout the rooftops of London. All, as I was reading it to my children, I'm like, this reminds me of Mary Poppins here. But you, <laughs> you, you revealed to me, even though you like the Heidelberg cat to kiss him, you may not be as much of a cat fan. Is that I true? hate cats with the fire of a thousand suns. I, I, really, I really can't stand them. I regard them as snooty and uppity and unrelational. And I know you're brandishing one at me right now, but I just, no, we have a dog. We have a large golden retriever. Um, I feel like pets should be closer to the size of a lion than the size of a rat. That's my general <laughs> rule of thumb. And so, no, we are, we are not, we're not cat people. Um, but, of, and people have joked and said, maybe you should write your next book based on, you know, if you've got something catechism, could you use the something dogma? And so maybe we could expand the animals. But um, there you go. now I've just stuck with cat. <laughs> That's great. Now, having written this for your children and they're reading this book, this little cat named Grace, uh, are they saying, Mom, Dad, can we get a cat, please? <laughs> <laughs> no, fortunately, their dog, they, they already got the dog into their house before we've read the book. And that was probably a wise move. <laughs> One of our uh, uh, followers on Facebook had written in and said, um, her name is Adri actually, she's on Instagram, Adriana. She asked, there are many other catechisms out there. Mm, yeah. What is it about the Heidelberg that really resonated with you? I think it's the one, it's the most sort of warm hearted one. I think that's a very subjective, fluffy judgment in a way. But I think if you were to read all the reform, if you were to read the sort of Belgic, Helvetic, Westminster, Heidelberg, both the catechisms and confessions, probably the only rival to me in terms of prose and the sort of emotional resonance of, of it would actually be in the Book of Common Prayer, where I mm. think some of the prayers in that, but 
they in England at least people they're done to death I mean in a good way everybody knows them but like our marriage liturgy even if you're not a believer would still be based on Cranmer whereas Heidelberg is much less well known at least in Britain Presbyterianism is nothing like as large here as it is in the US and so most people don't know that most people are new to it when I've introduced it to people here mm. um, and and so and I just found I couldn't believe this stuff had been written 500 years ago I, I was so captivated by the writing and the warmth of uh, sort of the theological um, is a sort of a rich it's like it's like eating like a sort of fruitcake or something it's really rich but it's really sweet and edifying and nourishing and lovely it does it doesn't feel harsh and reform theology often can I think it can often be you know not presented with a kind of resonance and joy and bounce whereas Heidelberg I read it and I think this is just I want this to be true. It's just delightful. And uh, starting with question one, which I just think is one of the most wonderful paragraphs of Christian theology ever written. And then the very final line of, you know, what does this little word Amen express? You know, it, it's just beautifully pastoral. And uh, I think that's why. You're absolutely right. The, uh, it is pastoral. Uh, it, it really is written to encourage somebody. Um, and, and you're not the only one. I think everybody who picks it up and reads it for the first time like, oh, I was expecting, um, you know, this list of, uh, of facts yeah. that you would go to on a website and like, exactly. you know, why this? Here's the answer. Why this? Here's the answer. <laughs> and you can tell because it, because the question is regularly like, what's, you know, the opening one is like, what's your comfort? Like, what do you find? But that's such a pastoral question. That's the question you need to give people who are who, who is asked by people who are dying or struggling with losing a job or whatever. And, and so often they return to that theme and say, why does this give you comfort? Where's the comfort in the doctrine of Christ's mm. intercession or whatever? It's just a beautiful text and, and very, yeah, as I'm a pastor and, a, you know, and I want to teach my kids. And I just think it's a beautiful way of doing both of those things. Absolutely. In, in the book, Sophie has um, had a moment where she's broken down. She sinned against her sister, I believe. In the story, she is learning about repentance and grace. Uh, as a father, um, how, how would you encourage somebody? You know, you read the story, but then you've got to go day to day, <laughs> mm. parenting a child. You want them to learn what is right and wrong, but at the same time, you want them to understand that salvation justification is by faith alone could you talk about that balance of trying to you know point your kids to the the right way of loving each yeah. other and and serving the lord and yet not making it legalistic to where they're thinking they're earning god's favor it's a tough balance it isn't yeah it is i i i think it's i think the best lesson the best way of doing that as a parent as and i'm you know obviously i've got three kids my oldest is 12 youngest is four i'm i'm learning this all the time and getting it wrong a lot of the time too but I feel like children catch that from the way that we as parents uh, treat them in response to their sin against us. And I think they, children, whether we like it or not, you see this throughout history, don't you, that people basically project uh, their fathers onto God. And, and that's how, or their mothers perhaps, but usually their fathers primarily, and particularly boys. And you can see that even in the great reformers, can't you? You can see, you know, Hans Luther is significant. So you can see that in kind of, in the lives of the of many believers. And I think if we ourselves are, are able to communicate the mixture of this thing you did is wrong. You must say, sorry, here is the consequence of it. I love you. I will never stop loving you. That never changes, but this is not acceptable, but I still love you. If we can keep that duality in our parenting, I think when we teach it from scripture, which is clearly what the Bible teaches as well, uh, then it can, comes with some weight and some reality. Whereas I think if we if we teach grace, but with a manner of a parent who seems austere or distant, or conversely, actually, we could teach grace with a manner of a parent who just lets anything go and, and miss then you're going to have an antinomian child, even if what you doctrinally teach them is correct. It's never going to bear good fruits. I, I think in some ways what happens, has to happen is we as parents have to, or teachers or kids workers or whoever we are have to internalize the gospel in that way in our own hearts such that the way we interact with children reflects what the gospel actually is because they will see it and feel it much more than they'll learn it doctrinally that's so true isn't isn't that what one of the gifts of grace is as luther says in his first thesis the christian life is a life of repentance and that's yeah. grace if we're yeah. able to live repentantly before each other 
the kids will say, oh, dad's a sinner, but he also is running to Jesus for forgiveness often. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I, I ultimately, I think that's, you know, the great, the catechism that will really shape our, our kids is, of course, the, the life we lead in front of them and the way that we interact with them. But I think it's good to be able to, you know, correspond. You want them to understand why. You don't just want to be a good parent and ignore the gospel, but you, when you preach it, you want to make sure that you're living it uh, such that they can see it in action as well. Uh, so true. That's so true. Well, the last question I have for you comes from uh, one of our, our, our followers. So she, she put this, it's Melanie in Northern Virginia. She's very interested in writing children's books. I believe this is your first one. Uh, and is, you kind yeah. of at the beginning mentioned uh, how the idea came about, but she's just curious if any tips and advice about how to go about putting it together and, and trying to get a story out there. Ooh, well, um, so I've actually just, I've, my, my pitch for my second kids book is out, is at the moment is out in the ether. It's some, um, you know, I have a, uh, an agent who effectively does that now and, and puts it out there, but I've sort of written it up and written a, a, a script. And so I'm going through exactly this process for the second time. Um, and I mean, because I think I wanted to write a rhyming book, that's a, it's, it's obviously, there's a very clear thing about identifying a, a reader age of child and then what sorts of books do those children read and what's the best way of making them compelling? I think I've learned some things even from this book. I think the, the text is too small. I think the pictures are too similar. I think there are some lines that I could have written, but I, there's some things I would want to change even now, I think about it. Um, but I think it's, I think the, the process of writing and rewriting and rewriting and reading, I mean, basically this is true for any book, not just kids' books. You have to read a lot of books and then you have to write a lot and then you have to read a lot and write a lot and you just have to keep doing that until it, uh, until you ha you're happy with it. I think then the process of actually getting it published is much more obviously at the publisher end. You have to decide, in my case, I, I already had contacts with publishers through my other work and so I could pitch one and say, what do you think? Um, but a lot of publishers do take open submissions and if they don't, you, you can go to the ones who do. And if nobody says yes, you can still decide if you want, if you feel strongly about it, you can decide to publish it yourself. So there's lots of different routes out there um, but I, I think the, the getting the best text possible is, is really a, just a question of writing and rewriting and reading. And I don't know that there's any shortcut to that process. At least if there is, I haven't found it yet. Maybe she should ask me again in five years. <laughs> well, I, it's a very honest answer uh, of any sort of creative process. It, it, it's a process of discovery, really, isn't it? And yeah. you just kind of keep chiseling and working away at it. And uh, I heard one Hollywood producer once say, uh, in response to a question, how do you know your movie's done? And he's like, uh, because of the deadline of it being released in movie theaters. <laughs> yeah, 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 I, I think so, exactly. Well, uh, Pastor Andrew, thank you for joining us here uh, and for this short time. And I really appreciate your heart um, to, to pass along this kind of warmth reminder of God's grace to children. And I, I well, pray thank that the you. Lord will... Yeah, absolutely. And I pray the Lord will, will continue to bless this cute little book. It is, even though you may be critical of it, we really enjoyed reading it. The illustrations are beautiful. And of course, the story is very sweet. So may the Lord use it for his glory. Thank you so much, Troy. Yeah, God bless. All right, good. We got it. And I think you've got enough time to get a couple of I have got time. Call. Do you know what? You know, you know, English people. I, it's exactly what I was going to go and do. I'm going to go and make a tea in my coffee mug. So That's thank you great. so much, Troy. It's lovely to You're talk welcome. to you. You're welcome.